It's no secret that we love our Arabian horses and those that have come into our lives as a result. From the everyday amateur to the professional trainer, AHT Talks is here to chat about the latest happenings, get to know some of our favorite individuals, and answer some of the questions we're all eager to know. Now, here's our host, Laura Ames. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm super honored today to have my uncle John Ames and his daughter and my cousin Lori Ames joining me. Um, today, I want to talk with my uncle just about his involvement with the Arabian horse and the enjoyment it brings to him and his family and what maybe advice he could offer to somebody just getting into the horse business with their family and what it has done for his family. So welcome, John. Thank you. Let's start out, John. Um, how did you get involved with the Arabian horse? I got involved in Arabian horses through Dick Games in 1972. I bought a horse from him named Sharaka for $3,800. I took him home and went back and bought two more horses from him. And my daughter Lori started showing horses at a very young age. Let's talk about your uh, participation at horse shows. It's been an, a generational deal. You've shown, Lori's shown, Sophie's shown. Share what that means to do this and to share it with your daughters, wife, cousins. I mean, there's been a lot of Ames family members that have shown horses. Well, <clears throat> our first trainer was Jerry McCray in Western. Lori had a Western horse that I think she was seven or eight years old. Um, it was uh, very enjoyable to see her grow from a young girl to a, an adult showing horses. And my daughter, Ellen, is a great supporter, and she knows quite a bit about horses. She does not show horses, though. And then my granddaughter, that I spoiled very much, got into horses, and it was... She got into walk, trot first, and then um, uh, she grew into uh, English and country and so on. She's shown in Western, and it's a very enjoyable time for I and my family. Okay, so let's next talk about... John, when you think of some moments that stand out, you've had some wins at Scottsdale... You've had wins at U.S. Nationals, obviously a ton at the local level, and just share with us uh, maybe some moments that stand out for you. Well, one moment is uh, the first time we went to the U.S. Nationals and Lori showed, and I think she made top 10, and that was uh, en very enjoyable. And then my granddaughter, went to the U.S. Youth Nationals and won the championship class, and that was very enjoyable. But whether you win, lose, or whatever, um, it's all enjoyable. Everyone's not going to win. Yeah. So our family, it's a large family. Some of the family members are into the horses, some are not. I know some of our family members probably look at us crazy for the amount of money we probably spend at this. But what do you think or what advice could you give to the newcomer about the investment they make and what it can do for a youth, your family, of having, I'm gonna call it the Arabian horse experience. Well, for our family, the Arabian horses helped stick us together very close. My wife used to come to every horse show. She was very good at the pedigrees. She doesn't anymore. It's usually just Lori, Ellen, and I that go, and Laura and Lolly, and to the Arabian horse uh, shows. And then we have Persians that's held our family together that my older brother Dick started in 92. And we compete, they're Ames Construction Ambassadors, and they're fun to watch, and it holds us together. I think the horses to, I know a lot of people can't spend a lot of money that it takes, but just having a horse there and, and showing competing, 
it's good for kids to meet people, socialize, and and just get to know people. And uh, whether you win or whatever you take in the class, it's it. You should feel proud, and uh, you should take some advice from uh, experienced horse trainers or whomever that knows something about a horse if you're going to start and enjoy yeah so you've been doing this for a lot of years maybe more years than you want to say <laughs> but what uh if you could change one thing about the horse industry and let's just focus on the arabian industry what would you change there's too many classes i changed the classes uh it's getting to be too much. Yeah. And I think some of the shows are getting to be too long. And I think people get discouraged on that. Not only that, it's, it's very expensive. Yeah. Which leads into another thing, John. Obviously, I, anybody that's been to Scottsdale area and been out into North Scottsdale has drove by your place at Christmas time. And they see these unbelievable amount of lights. And what, it, I mean, it's like a fairy tale. Do you want to share, uh, because you give so much back, do you want to share the various organizations and what you do at your Christmas events that's for maybe not such the privileged family or privileged child? We, uh, we started doing the Christmas lights in 93, and we started with needy kids and we used to have, our first year we had 50 children. They all get presents. And now we're up to 800 children. Uh, we have uh, carnival rides for them. We have horse rides. I got a couple of Persians. I got pretty cheap. So, <laughs> and uh, it's a great event. We not only do a uh, risk, uh, children we do camelot which is horse therapy boys and girls club and i do a lot of stuff helping other people on fundraisers and i also want to uh, thank ames construction for being a great supporter yeah so with those christmas parties uh early on i remember you maybe had you know like uh What's the movie called Christmas Vacation? But can you share your Christmas vacation moment with us? Because didn't you have one early on in your light, your unveiling of your lights? Yeah, we were putting up lights one night. Things weren't going very good. And uh, if you know the Ameses, we get a little excitable once in a while. <laughs> I was giving everyone hell at 11.30 on a Friday night, and they all walked over to me and used the F word on me, and they walked away and quit, and I was there all by myself, and I had to beg them to come back, and I went out at midnight and bought them all a steak dinner. <laughs> but it's been, it's really been enjoyable. Uh, That's one of my greatest satisfactions in my life. But everyone supported us too, so. Yeah, I, re, uh, I remember almost every year, Dad would have me call Uncle John and pretend that I was with the local media station and uh, I'm gonna be coming out to do an interview and poor John fell for it every year. And, the, <laughs> and Dad would always put me up to it, but he sure enjoyed the lights too, so. Um, that leads into the next deal. You had a close relationship with my dad, and uh, a few years ago, I remember being at U.S. Nationals, and some, someone came up to me, and they said, boy, I think I saw your dad's twin, and I said, I bet you saw his brother. <laughs> yeah, gosh, they look just alike. I was like, yep. So why don't you just share with everybody the unique relationship, because I think dad and you did have a very... Um, close relationship and just touch on that well in the horses we had a great relationship but sometimes I during the construction earlier days behind shut doors it got a little hairy in there 
<laughs> but I'll say one thing. We never went home mad at each other. But in the horse uh, industry, um, I'm going to tell you a little story. It was um, three and a half years ago in July, Dick come to Arizona and we were doing a big highway job with all of our big mining equipment and that. And Dick really loved that. I spent the whole week with him. And uh, on that Thursday, God, don't check on this. I could be wrong. I'm getting older. So, but on a Thursday, we flew to Lexington. Yep. Lexington to watch his daughter, Laura, and my daughter, Lori, show. And, uh, I got a picture of he and I on a golf cart. It was the last picture he and I took together. And we enjoyed just going around the grounds there and we went to the museum and everything. And, and then we were watching a class and I was sitting at one end and Dick was at the other and Liz uh, Moore was sitting in the middle and Dick and I were both sleeping, and she says, we got two bookends. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Dick and I enjoyed each other at work. We enjoyed each other at work, too. So it's been a hell of a run. <laughs> okay. Let's touch on one uh, topic that uh, I know you've had a lot played on you. You've played a lot. The Ames family is known for doing practical jokes. Let's maybe share with us a couple of your favorites. You played on some and a couple you've had played on you because I know they're pretty entertaining. Well, I'll tell you one. I was going to a hardware store on a Sunday and I get a phone call and this lady is on the phone asking me how I am. <laughs> and I kept saying, who is this? She says, John, you know, you know who this is. And I'm a lot older than I used to be. If I was younger, I might have known. But in this case, I, I was clean slate. I says, who is this? And she kept doing sexy stuff. And I says, I do not know you, ma'am. And I got so <laughs> frustrated, I was getting sweaty. And all of a sudden, I heard Dick laugh in the background. It was Laura. <laughs> And uh, that's about one of the biggest ones. I um, what's what? Share one you pulled on someone, because I'm sure you pulled some on someone too. I think I remember one on Grandpa. Wasn't there one on Grandpa? Yeah, you did? I called my dad. Dick's the one who squealed on me too. <laughs> I called my dad one snowy day in Minnesota. No one was working, and <laughs> my mother. Or dad answered the phone, and I pretend I was a radio announcer. And I said, Mr. Ames, if you can name this tune, you can win $2,000. <laughs> My dad says, oh, dad got so frustrated. He uh, says, oh, my wife isn't here. She went to get her hair done. I will not know. I says, well, we got 15 seconds. I said, sir, just take a, a guess. So I had a record back in the saddle by Gene Autry. So I played it, and Dad, I've never seen Dad frustrated, but he was then. He says, sir, I do not know. I apologize. My wife is getting her hair done in Farmington, Minnesota. And uh, I hung up the phone. Well, I told Dick and everybody at the office what I did. <laughs> Well, about four days later, Dad knocks on my door of our house, and I open, and I says, well, hi, Dad. He says, this isn't a sociable visit. <laughs> he says, you smart ass. <laughs> he just ripped me one. <laughs> so I called Dick. I says, you dirty devil, you squealed on me. <laughs> Dick really, he told that story a hundred times. Oh, Dad loved that story, yeah. In closing... What would people not know about John Ames that, that is, just share something that most people don't know about you, John? They don't know my IQ is a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and I listen to these people at these horse shows and that I don't say anything else because I know I'm my ability is way more than theirs and I'm always right if I say something. <laughs> Well, John, we thank you today for taking the time to visit with us, and uh, we wish you the best of luck in this upcoming show season. Yeah, and then I've got to say something else. Uh, the year we went to Lexing Lexington was the last time Dick and I went to a horse show together. And uh, the following January, he passed away, and I'll never forget that uh, that week I spent with him. Thank you. <laughs>